Hello, and thank you for joining us with, thanks for joining us for this fourth uh, of our webinar series celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, or to most folks, NCHEMS. These webinars are hosted by NCHEMS staff members who have some real specific knowledge in higher education issues and practices. Today, we're featuring NCHEM Sarah Torres Lugo as she and her guests discuss our efforts with the Foundation for Student Success to really crack how campuses can change their cultures for the reduction of equity gaps and better student success for everyone. I am Sally Johnstone, president of NCHEMS, and before I turn this over to Sarah, let me explain our format. We will be listening to the panelists discuss a series of issues for the first part of this webinar. Then we will ask them to respond to your questions. I am also joined today by two of my colleagues here at NCHEM, Stacy Ziss, who will monitor the questions uh, you want to ask the panelists, and Liz Weeks, who will be running the webinar. Now, to pose a question or a comment, please click on the Q&A in the controls. If you're in a full screen mode, which of course we hope you are so you can see everything, you might need to hover your mouse over your screen to make the controls visible. Once you click on the Q&A, a window will appear. You can type in your question in the text field and click send to submit it. If you want to pose a question to a specific panelist, please make sure to begin your question with the name of that particular panelist. The chat function will not be monitored, so please use only the Q&A feature. Let me turn this over now to Sarah to get us going. Thank you, Sally. Liz, may we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So let me first talk a bit about why it is necessary to re-examine business as usual of campuses of higher education. A major impetus behind change is a general pattern of declining numbers of high school graduates. Many of you have probably seen this information before, but I think it is worth repeating. As Witchy's Knocking at the College Door report makes clear, Nationally, we are facing a future of declining numbers of high school graduates. On the top chart on this slide, the blue part of the line represents confirmed counts of graduates, and the projected years are in the orange portion of the line. The vertical line points out to the 2018-2019 academic year. As you see here, the U.S. is in a period of slowdown in the number of high school graduates. After years of steady increases, it is predicted that the annual number of U.S. high school graduates has leveled out at around 3.4 to 3.5 million graduates. The number of graduates per year nationally are projected to hover around this number through the year 2023 before peaking at about 3.6 million prior to the year 2026. This peak fueled by an increase in the number of non-white high school graduates, as shown in the bottom chart here, represents about 4% more graduates over the previous high in 2013. Beyond the year 2026, the number of high school graduates in the US will decline about 8% to 3.25 million, as fewer children born through, through, during the Great Recession and the subsequent recovery enter high school through the early 2030s. So in other words, by the early 2030s, we may be down to about the number of graduates seen around 2008. Liz, next slide, please. Thank you. While this is a national pattern, there is substantial regional variation. States in orange on this map are states with robust growth for a number of years. But despite their continued growth, these regions will experience average rates of increase much lower than in the early 2000s to 2013. The majority of states project projected to face declines in the number of high school graduates for a number of years are in the Midwest and the Northeast. They are the states in blue on this map. Given post-secondary institutions 
heavy reliance on enrollments of students straight out of high school, recent declines and further projected declines need to be seriously considered in campus planning. Liz, next slide, please. Thank you. In our regions, the overwhelming majority of projected increases in the number of high school graduates will be attributable to Hispanic students. Decreases in the number of high school graduates in the Midwest and Northeast will be driven by fewer white graduates. In comparing future grads to those who left high school in 2013, our colleagues at WICHE give us a comparison at three points in time, 2020, 2025, and 2032, broken down by demographics. Here, the bars above the line represent increases and those below the midline indicate indicate declines. This shows that nationally, six to 14% fewer white high school graduates are projected between 2020, 2032, compared to 2013. Meanwhile, growing numbers of Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander graduates offset the decreasing number of white high school graduates, at least nationally. In 2020 and the years leading up to it, Strong increases of Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander high school graduates offset to a great extent the declining population, leading to the generally stable numbers. By 2025, the surge in Hispanic high school graduates plus an approximate 14% increase in the number of Asian Pacific Islander graduates offsets the declines in white students. But by 2032, recent steep decreases in the number of children born indicates that there will be a reduction in high school graduates in the early 2030s. Of every race and ethnicity except Asian Pacific Islander graduates, nationally, there will be a slightly fewer black high school graduates in most of the projected years, and American Indian, Alaska Native graduates are also projected to decline in number. So in the face of these demographic shifts, it is critical that we re-examine practices since a large share of the growing population is of students not traditionally well-served by our systems of higher education. Sally, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Sarah. NCHIMS hosts the Foundation for Student Success. And I serve as the executive director of FSS. Now, it was formed when the assets of the not-for-profit organization Predictive Analytics Reporting, or PAR, was acquired by a for-profit company. The board of PAR decided to use the resulting funds to form a foundation and relate that foundation's activities to the original mission of PAR, that is, using data analytics and analysis for better student success. The Foundation for Student Success Board of Directors, and Liz, can you go to the next slide for us, whose names you can see right now on the screen, wanted to, wanted to do something really unique in the area of student success. They decided to focus on a critically important problem for American post-secondary education the unfortunate gap in success for Black, Latinx, and American Indian students. While there are numerous organizations and projects working on this issue, including Achieving the Dream, the Aspen Institute's College for Excellence Program, American Association of State Colleges and Universities, the National Association of, of System Heads, and numerous others, none of them are explicitly tackling the issue of campus culture itself. The board members realized that changing the culture of a campus won't happen quickly, that it usually takes eight to 10 years and really needs to outlast the leaders who first began the process. The Foundation for Student Success set out to find a way to understand how some colleges and universities have substantially altered their culture, their campus cultures, in ways that greatly reduce or even eliminate their gaps in equity for student success for these different demographic groups. In addition, 
we wanted to learn how members of those campuses could help others with their campus culture changes. I'm going to turn this back to Sarah, who's going to um, help you understand how we began that exploration. And I'll be back later to share some of our conclusions. Thank you, Sally. So in fall of 2016, Entrum staff used publicly available data sources to identify a small group of community colleges and public universities across the country whose students were being more successful than input variables, such as proportion of Pell eligible students, ACT, SAT scores, high school grades, would predict. The analysis began by including those institutions with a student body made up of at least 25% American Indian, Black, and or Latinx students. While the input variables were a little different for the community colleges than for the universities, the results allowed the identification of institutions that might have some promising practices. The focus was public institutions because they are the institutions where the majority of students from the target population attend. We then supplemented the quantitative component with a qualitative component. And some staff interviewed leaders at these institutions. The FSS board members evaluated the information gathered and they identified colleges, colleges and universities that had been successful in changing the culture on their campuses and knew what was key to igniting and sustaining change that resulted in improved student success and increased parity and outcome. These institutions were then invited to become mentors. We selected mentor institutions that represent rural and urban institutions of higher education, Hispanic serving institutions, and historically black colleges and universities. We purposefully selected institutions that are, are, are across the nation. Each of the seven institutions was then matched with three similar campuses whose leaders agreed to have their campuses be mentees. Mentee institutions committed to work towards achieving the student success related goals they set for the two year project. Based on fall 2016 IPEDS data, the 21 mentee institutions enrolled about 216,000 students, of whom over 99,000 students are American, Indian, Black, or Hispanic. The seven mentor institutions include a total of over 120,000 students, of whom over 52,000 are American, Indian, Black, or Hispanic. The University of South Florida served as one of the seven mentor institutions. And Dr. Paul Dosal is joining us today to share the story of USF's continuing transformational culture change process that in the past decade or so has led to an increase in student success and equity gap reduction. Paul, I'll now turn it to you. Thank you, Sarah. And we were honored and, and happy to join the Foundation for Student Success as a mentor institution. And I'm uh, happy to be with you this afternoon to share with you our efforts to promote student success at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Uh, we launched our student success movement in 2009 with the formation of a 100 member student success task force that produced a lengthy document that has served as our blueprint for the transformation of our institutional culture and laid the foundations for the um, impressive gains that we've realized over the last uh, nine or 10 years. Uh, although we implemented a whole series of programs, policies, practices that are, are common to other universities across the country, we also recommended that the university make an institutional commitment to student success as part of a larger cultural change in which student success was recognized by the entire community as a top priority. Um, we didn't realize then how important that was going to be, but in, in retrospect, I can see now how clearly important it was to convince ourselves, our students, our faculty and staff, that we could and should change our institutional culture to benefit our students. At the time, we thought that there were all sorts of reasons why we could not improve our student success 
great. Uh, we offered up uh, every um, kind of excuse. We were a commuter school. We enrolled too many low-income students who had to work too often, too many hours, or there were too many underrepresented minorities, and that uh, we uh, therefore could not attain the gains that we actually realized. So we had to convince ourselves that we could do this, we should do this, and so we made an institutional commitment, and that, that starts at the top, that is with our board of trustees, our president, our senior leadership, uh, and, and that has made all the difference in the world. As you'll see in the next slide, showing our six-year graduation rate gains from 2009 to the present, um, we increased our six-year rate from 51% to 73%, and the rate is still climbing. We expect it to hit 75% with the, the next cohort. And a lot of this, I think, is attributable to the, the change in culture. Uh, there are certainly practices that we implemented and programs that are also responsible for this. Um, but we made student success a top priority. We planned for performance and we held ourselves accountable for that performance. And that has changed the way we think and, and act. Uh, what I want to point out in this as I, as I move forward is that we, we realized quick gains from 51 to 67, and then we hit what we called a, plot, a performance plateau, where our rates were stuck at 67, but we were uh, challenged to raise our rates to 70% uh, at a minimum because that was a state benchmark used for performance funding metrics. And so we challenged ourselves to, to get off that plateau and move above 70%. And we were in a similar position with respect to our first retention rate, which had increased from about 80% to 88, uh, where it plateaued. But we needed to get to 90% and beyond because of state performance benchmarks set at 90% for excellence on that key metric. So beginning in 2014 and 2015, uh, we began to turn to the use of big data or predictive analytics to help us move off that performance plateau. So what you'll see in the next slide is a screenshot of our predictive analytics platform. We engaged Civitas Learning uh, to deploy a platform that would allow us to gain more insights on students' performance and, and help us identify students who would benefit from some kind of timely intervention. Uh, in the Civitas platform, the data is pulled from our student information system, Banner, as well as our learning management system, Canvas, uh, to pull uh, at least 10 years of data um, and using about 300 variables. Uh, the platform can help us identify the likelihood of a student persisting into the next year. And so uh, this platform went live in 2015, uh, and that began a process uh, internally of trying to figure out how to act on these insights. Uh, we were challenged to act, we were challenged to move the needle on those key metrics, retention and persistence, and figuring out this tool, how to act on these insights, helped us uh, change our practices and eventually move ourselves off that plateau. What you see here is a screenshot of our FTIC students in the fall 2016 cohort. And we, we can gather data on all of our freshman students. They are then sorted into categories or buckets, we call them, based on the likelihood of the student's likelihood of persisting into the next semester or the next year. And so as we saw this, uh, we were then able to identify students by name by clicking on the link in that, that list and share a list of students who were, for some reason or another, struggling. In our case, most of the students fell into the high or very high categories. 98% were high or very highly likely to persist. So we initially decided to focus our efforts on figuring out how to, student, how to help students in the very low, low 
and moderate buckets, knowing that if we were just to move 80 more students uh, from fall to fall retention or graduation, we would hit the metrics assigned to us, basically a 90% retention or a 70% six-year graduation. So that began the process of, of trying to figure out how to set ourselves up to change the way we do our work to help out these students in a timely way. So we formed in early 2016 a persistence committee. And on the, this slide, you'll see uh, the, the membership of this committee, a cross-functional team that pulls together the people and offices who touch the life of basically all of our undergraduate students. Uh, academic advocates who are essentially acting as our case managers, but also pulling in teams from, from residential life, uh, orientation team leaders, everybody who is in a position to help out students uh, and help us figure out what they needed first and then provide timely support to those students. So they came together in 2016 and it helped that this cross-functional team uh, was made up of people who were all basically integrated into a new unit that we formed uh, by combining traditional student affairs units plus enrollment planning and management units and undergraduate student, uh, undergraduate studies units, all of them touching the life of an undergraduate student, and they, they came together in one unit uh, supervised by a vice president, myself, and it helped then that we were all on the same team. Uh, we had done so much work to eliminate the traditional silos that hamper our work, and so together they were charged with finding out what it would take to move more students uh, toward second year retention and timely graduation. And so this team comes together, uh, they review the list of students provided to them from the Civitas platform, and they began basically to triage those students and figure out what they needed and who was in the best position to provide that support uh, to move them on. And the results have been promising as you'll see, as we look at our graduation rates by race and ethnicity, we did manage to pull ourselves off that performance plateau. And so uh, we hit, um, we moved from a 68% six year graduation rate to 71, and it's still climbing. And we also moved our retention rate from 88 to 90, and that is also still climbing to 91, and we're expecting it to hit 92. And more importantly, uh, we wanted to achieve equity in outcomes. And so we always disaggregate the data by race, ethnicity, and income, and even gender, uh, hoping to see parity in the outcomes. And so in this table, you see the six-year grad rate by race and ethnicity. In the last two cohorts, you will see we've basically achieved parity. The numbers change year to year, but our black Hispanic students are graduating at rates equal to or sometimes higher than white students. Our Asian students are graduating at rates higher than all other groups. Um, and we're, we're pleased with this re these results. This is what we want to see. We want to see, in fact, equity in, in outcomes. We also measure by uh, limited income status, basically using Pell versus non-Pell as a proxy. We're close to achieving that parity. In the last 2012 cohort, for example, you'll see Pell students graduated at 73% rate and non-Pell graduated slightly higher at 74. We would like to see that equal in previous years, like the 2010 cohort, you'll see that the, the Pell students graduated at a rate one point higher than non-Pell students. So we're pleased with that, but still not satisfied. We're always looking at equity gaps and, and we know that we also have a, a more vexing one, which is troubling us um, by gender, with male students underperforming across the board. Um, but we've set ourselves up in a way using the, the predictive analytics by our persistence committee to help us promote higher graduation rates, as well as eliminate or close the achievement gaps. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Sarah. Thanks for sharing, Paul. 
For more information about USS Journey, I invite you all to visit fssawards.org and click on Case Studies. You will find information about the journey of all seven mentor institutions on that website. And you can, I'm sure, feel free to browse their website and perhaps find some more information. So I'd like to talk about the process we used for FSS's first project. After selecting mentor institutions, which you'll see in green on this slide, and you only see five because we had two mentors in California and two mentors in Florida. Um, so after selecting mentor institutions, mentors gathered in person in December of 2016 to discuss expectations, ideas, and goals for the project. In spring 2017, staff from mentee colleges, those are in the shade of pink on this map, they visited the mentor campus to start the process of understanding how the mentor institutions were able to manage their long journey of institutional transformation that resulted in improved student success and parity in outcomes. Our point person or persons at mentor campuses created the agenda and invited various key players from their campus to speak with the mentee institution guests. Before leaving the mentor campus, we asked each Menti campus team to provide a list of topics they would like to discuss with the mentor institution during the two-year project. And we also asked them to outline goals for the project, keeping in mind that two years is a short time. These goals were later revised, in most cases several times, as teams narrowed down their focus and adapted to changes at the campus level, system level, and or state level. FSL staff coordinated periodic conference calls between the staff members of mentor institutions and their mentees as the mentees refined their goals and implemented their action plans for the project. <clears throat> FSL staff listened in, in on each call in order to document the process. In December 2017, mentors gathered again in person to discuss progress. Some main takeaways from that meeting included how important context is, there is no silver bullet solution, or a secret sauce. A tension that is common on campuses is a question of who owns student success. And another takeaway was that there is always more work to be done, and mentors have much to learn from their mentees. In spring 2018, the mentor and mentee institutions were featured in webinars focused on tough conversations toward equitable student success. We have recordings of these webinars on the FSS website as well. In spring 2018 and spring 2019, mentee institutions disseminated a campus-wide survey to gauge campus culture and also submitted reports on progress made on the goals they set for the project. The main takeaways from these activities include, ask students rather than assume what works for them. It is important to modify deficit and intimidating language usage that can alienate students. So for example, during last year's National Student Success Conference hosted by University of South Florida, a panelist suggested using a term like high priority students instead of the common at-risk students verbiage that's used. Another important takeaway is how important it is to understand your student population and to tailor your practices so they are culturally relevant. For example, one of our mentor institutions serves a largely first-generation student body. Understanding the challenges that first-generation students oftentimes experience and, this, and also understanding that their students come from Spanish-speaking households they invite families tonight at the campus to speak with families in their own language about what to expect if the prospective student decides to pursue a post-secondary education. That's not necessarily at, the camp, at this specific campus. Their aim is to help families understand the process in its entirety and that they themselves feel like they're informed well enough to make a decision of where to send their students or when to send them and if to send them. And they also talk about resources available to help make those decisions. 
Another takeaway is the importance of ensuring that you have measurable goals that are closely monitored. Also carefully consider a regional approach to advancing student success and equity initiatives. So this includes fostering meaningful relationships with all levels of public schooling in the community, local government, community organizations, and business leaders. So our work needs to be aligned for greatest impact. A phrase we heard often was equal partners in one degree, and so is aligned to one degree. Another takeaway, educate the campus on your data in order to build trust in it. Disaggregate your data and create opportunities to have faculty review data on student achievement at the course and section level to better understand that student's experience in the course. For greatest impact, you really should provide instructor support for trying new possible improvements now that they have the data and that they have a better sense of what might not be working. You also need to be proactive. So Paul mentioned some of this about knowing when to intervene and how to intervene. And he's also talked about having the right person intervene. Don't wait until a small issue becomes a larger issue down the line. The way you allocate resources says a lot more than a mission statement. Something else that came up a lot is that when there are strong opposing opinions about how to best move forward or what steps to take, put the student at the center of the conversation. Most of us on campus are interested in helping students be become successful. We might not agree as to how we get there, but if we could refocus the conversation, then perhaps we can move a little faster. Also consider the context in which practices were formed and how they might not fit the current context. Intentionally engineer the integration of, a diverse, of diversity into campus. So this means doing things like integrating diversity into the curriculum, so that all students can express the value of attending a diverse institution. And this is especially important as our nations become more interconnected. Something else we learned, um, you know, consider the assumptions and preconceived notions that you might have. These will continue to be challenges if they are not intentionally addressed. So some of these assumptions and preconceived notions might include things like, now, if we change practice, that's going to reduce rigor. That's something we hear a lot, and it's part of the backlash to some of this work. Something else that might be coming up is, you know, you're not understanding that while you say you're colorblind, genderblind, et cetera, it might be the case on one level, but your understanding, actions, and decisions might be affected subconsciously, and that needs to be addressed. We learned numerous other things, like you know, how important it is to celebrate early wins. This can help you garner support. So use those champions, use those people that are ready to do this work and are very interested. And make sure that any small gains that they're able to make are celebrated, are shared. And that way, perhaps you can get, get some others to support some of these causes and do some of their own work. Think outside of the box and come up with some low resource means. So we heard things like using buttons or lanyard, lanyards or mentioning someone's good work at meetings. You're already having those meetings, so just make sure you carve out a little bit of time to make sure that others know what great work is going on on campus. Something else that we learned is how important it is to make strategic planning part of a campus-wide effort. Make sure people feel heard. Make sure that there is ownership so that this strategic plan can actually live beyond just being a report on a shelf. And so I've mentioned tons of things. We learned tons more. Um, but in April of 2019, we met with the mentor, mentees, and FSS board members to reflect on the participation in the project, provide feedback, and to help us distill what we, as a collective, have learned from the project. 
Sally, I'll turn it to you for a discussion on how we have distilled what we have learned about campus culture change. Thanks, Sarah. And Paul, thank you again for sharing the, the very real overview of certain aspects of the journey that the University of South Florida took to get to where you are now. Um, as, as we were winding down our work with the mentor and mentee campuses, and as Sarah has shared with you, <clears throat> the numerous lessons we learned, we began to think about how can we take what we've learned and push it out to the wider community. Um, we tried as hard as we could to get as much information as possible regarding how successful campuses did achieve their gains. But we also were focused on what were the greatest challenges that the campuses who were working to reduce their equity gaps began to encounter. And, and Paul mentioned some of those in, in his remarks, but Sarah brought up a few others. And none of this is simple, I think is the best way to put it. But as we went through looking at our surveys and the interviews that had happened and reviewing and reflecting on the conversations that had gone on for a year or so, over a year actually, uh, between these campuses, we began to filter it down to some very specific levers. Um, and we then took these levers to the meeting that Sarah mentioned with all the mentor and mentee campuses and had them uh, sort of vet them for us. And through that got greater refinement on them. But let me, let me just run through these for you. Um, the first lever is no surprise here, data collection, analysis, and of course use. In other words, how do, how do you find and really use the data that you have available on a campus? And you heard that part of the University of South Florida's strategy was to bring in an external product to help them understand their data better. Um, not all campuses did that, and yet they found ways to understand what they were doing and to break it down in meaningful ways. And that, of course, means engaging your institutional research offices as partners in this quest. Uh, and it may also mean uh, more tools and or skill sets for the individuals who work in institutional research. It also means, uh, as, as Paul said over and over, and I think Sarah mentioned too, developing the performance indicators on student success and really using the data to hold the campus community accountable. The second lever that we identified is the effective campus-wide communication and engagement. Uh, communication to the entire campus community is critical with regard to both the goals and the rationale of the culture change that needs to happen to enhance student success. There needs to be campus-wide training for faculty, including uh, less than full-time faculty, and of course, all non-academic staff. The data and progress toward those goals really needs to be shared with the campus community. And by that, it doesn't mean sending out a spreadsheet. It means having ways in which you can use the data to tell the stories about how every part of the campus is progressing in their role of assisting in students being successful. The other part of this in terms of campus-wide communication is that all faculty and staff have to be engaged as partners in the goal of institutional culture change. And that's the only real way you begin to move forward with equity gap reduction. It doesn't happen in a silo. And as Sarah pointed out, there's no magic bullet around any of this. The third of these levers 
has to do with hiring strategies and personnel policies. As you begin to hire new people into the campus community, it's critical to promote the campus culture change and include activities such as revising all your job descriptions, interview questions, ensuring diverse search committees, and of course, diversifying the job posting locations and how you are going out to recruit uh, anyone into the community. In interviews with potential new hires, it's really important to be very clear that all members of the campus community are held responsible for student success, everyone. The fourth letter, lever is really uh, auditing campus and state policies and practices to identify those that perpetuate the status quo. So you need to sort of help identify the alignment of the policies and practices with the institutional culture change goals and your desire to reduce your equity gap and the strategies around that. But in evaluating the practices, you need to look at those that can be easily changed and those that are mandated by institutional or state policies which will require more effort to change, but it doesn't mean they can't be. It's also important to work toward modifying all of the practices and policies that are needed to really knock the campus off the status quo that is less than successful with regard to all students being successful. Now, between the partnership with FSS and NCHEMS, we're currently developing inventories for campuses to be able to do their own assessment in these areas, these levers, so that they can discuss among all their members uh, of the campus community where they are and where they need to go next and how to sort of start that progression. Um, I'd like to turn now to some questions. And Stacy, do you have some questions for our panelists? I do. Thank you, Sally. We'll start with Paul. Paul, is the USF um, are you able? Is a, another campus able to replicate the USF model? Uh, sure. I, I think the model we've used can certainly be replicated. There, there are some easy wins here. Um, to institutionalize student success as a top priority for the institution. Uh, several things can be done. Uh, for example, uh, forming a student success council with representation from faculty, staff, and students um, to provide advice to senior leadership, to coordinate actions, to make sure everyone understands it's a top priority of the institution. That, that's low cost, uh, no cost even. Uh, the appointment of a vice president for student success to make sure that there is a person designated on campus who has the authority and responsibility for carrying out student success initiatives. Um, that too can be done. And then there, there are so many different things that can be done to create the appropriate institutional culture, some uh, communications and marketing strategies, posters, stationery with uh, the slogan we used years ago, Student success is everyone's responsibility. And we put it on stationery and pins, posters, uh, to express our interest in making sure that everybody on campus recognized that student success was a top priority. These are things everyone can do. Uh, but more directly, let's say, the work of our persistence committee can be uh, replicated elsewhere. Uh, you don't need to hire new people to do it. Instead, it's more like putting, pulling together people who are already doing their jobs, but might be operating in silos and not collaborating enough to promote student success. Uh, you don't need to hire more people. It's more like just pull together advisors, resident assistants, uh, financial aid counselors, counselors, uh, case managers, cashier's office, reps from the library, 
everybody who touches the life of a student, they, they can be pulled together to promote student success. Uh, again, this is low cost. And, and if people are also worried about using predictive analytics, I should also add that we also use in-house models that we developed uh, at relatively low cost. We did them internally. That, and these models also provide us with insights into student performance and predicts the likelihood of their persistence. Uh, but if, if you look at our model, the, the items we've spent money on and there, it's, it's not too much. Uh, the predictive analytics platform and, uh, and we hired about 12 case managers. We call them academic advocates, uh, but we never hired them all at once. We staggered that over the course of maybe five years. And so we never really faced a, a real big budget crunch uh, to get this done. So I think there's a lot that can be replicated elsewhere. And, and I'm happy to have conversations with people about um, how we have done that and how it can be done elsewhere. Stacy, can I add a little point there? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that, uh, back to what Paul was just saying with regard to uh, really disseminating information across the campus of how critical everyone is in their role of supporting student success. When we visited the University of South Florida, uh, it is a commuter campus. And one of the things that we did was you know, got to see the whole campus and it was a remarkable facility. But when you asked a parking lot attendant what his or her job was, the response was to help students succeed. And I would suggest that what they've done at the University of South Florida has really taken this notion of culture change toward greater student success to a level of maturity but as Paul is always pointing out to us, it's not done yet. Thanks. Thank you, Sally. Uh, Paul, just to follow up a little bit on this persistence committee, what was the process for creating it and were there obstacles? Um, well, there, there were some obstacles and, and I'd say the obstacles were ourselves, that is, uh, it took us some time to figure out how to use and act on the insights that we were generating from the predictive analytical models. And so I'll, I'll also share with you our, our first mistake. We set up a committee um, composed largely of senior level administrators to review the insights that we were seeing on the, the Civitas platform. And it's a case in point and a lesson learned here we pulled together influential policymakers and administrators, but it wasn't a team of people who were poised and prepared to take action. And so we, we met for about six months and, and we didn't do anything uh, except talk for six months. And that was a lesson learned because then I realized that I, I began to look more at the data insights that we were gathering from, from Civitas that I needed to pull together an action team, people who were closer to the students, who were trained and experienced in providing support to students. Uh, that made all the difference in the world when we pulled them together. Uh, one of the obstacles we faced in doing so, though, was that uh, the people and units we were trying to pull together were all in different reporting lines. And it, it required some high level institutional directives to make it known that these people were expected to work together to promote student success. It, it helped that I had great relations at the time with the VP for Student Affairs and the Dean of Undergraduate Studies who worked with me to set up the committee. But it, it still required a higher level directive to make sure everyone understood that this committee was charged and empowered to take action to promote student success. Thank you, Paul. Just a reminder for those in the, um, in the audience to please pose any questions they have in the Q&A box. Um, I have a question for Sarah. Sarah, what are some of the specific pressure points mentees most often brought up? Thanks, Stacey. I'm happy to provide some examples. 
So several mentees wanted to learn about strategies for hiring individuals that are well prepared to serve students coming to the institution. And so in our discussions about such strategies, we, we kept in mind that strategies have to be cognizant of differences in collectively bargained and not collectively bargained environments. And we had pods talk about things like the makeup of hiring committees and how important it is to have a hiring committee, what kind of training that they should receive, being intentional about where you are sharing those job postings, knowing that they're going to reach different groups of people. Also looking very intentionally at the interview questions. So making sure that there isn't, for example, just one very clear question that's supposed to get at, you know, do you have experience with working with others that are perhaps not like you, don't have the same background or experiences? Instead, how do you weave those into other questions so that it, it really speaks to your, your institution's commitment to serving all students and keeping in mind that students bring strengths and challenges that, that are varied and you need the people on your campus to know how to work with those. Um, some other things that we talked about is how do you make sure that once you have hired those individuals that are prepared to work with your students, how do you keep them? And so we have some institutions that are in very rural areas and they do experience a lot of challenges attracting um, you know, members to join their team. And so that's one of the challenges but then the challenge is also how do you retain them so now that you've put in all this work to have them apply to come on board how do you keep them on your campus so some of the things we talked about is when they do visit the campus before even before making their decision make sure that there are events set up so that they could meet others from varied backgrounds so that they could perhaps connect with someone that can share some of their experiences and make them feel like they will be welcome and that this will be a good place for them. And you know, once they do join, make sure that you are opening up the door for them to talk about whether or not they feel like they're included or there's a space for them on campus. Another pressure point we talked about was how to manage leadership changes. And you know we had several mentees and mentors experiencing some of that. And so we talked about things like how to make leadership changes an opportunity rather than an obstacle. And so one mentee, they shared how when they knew a new president was gonna be coming on board, you know, this specific um, team member in this mentee team made sure to get on the calendar of this president so that they could sit down and talk about you know what what are some of the things going on on campus what have they tried where is the institution going so that instead of just pausing and waiting for direction from new leadership they could inform that new direction some other pressure points um developmental education that was at the top of the list of priorities for several institutions and continues to be. Um, also, we had a lot of conversations around, you know, how do you, for example, help faculty on kind of change this gatekeeper mentality? So this idea that you are successful if your students are not getting A's, right? Or if perhaps they're dropping out. Instead, how do we change this mentality to a mentality of, I do have some tools that I could use to help more students be successful and move forward. Um, there is also a lot of interest in living learning communities. We, have a, we had a few mentees um, start these up at their institutions during the project and they got a lot of feedback from other institutions on what they tried, what seemed to work. And so that, that was one of the areas of interest. Um, also academic advising, it was high on the priority list as well. Different institutions trying new things. And 
also how to engage faculty. That was a, a big pressure point. So something we talked about was how to create the right circumstances for having conversations with faculty using data from you know their course or their section um, to to get at what they might want to do differently. And so how do you create these spaces for conversations where it's not a sort of, I guess it, it could just become a problematic conversation. And so how do you set it up so that these are productive, these are not sort of seen as a, you know, I'm, I'm being told what to do instead. How do we both perhaps find you someone else that can help you out? So maybe another faculty member that's trying to do something different in their classroom that has seen some, some success. And so, so that's some of what we talked about in terms of engaging faculty. Um, also how to, what data to gather and how to analyze it. So a lot of institutions, you know, they're, they're starting at a pretty foundational level of just what should we be looking at? And we did have a, a mentee campus tell us a bit about how they, you know, they really wanted to know what should I be gathering and how should I be doing that? And then they moved forward with creating some predictive modeling. And so, you know, understanding that it could be very problematic. So you have to be very careful in using predictive models because it could be imperfect and you could end up hurting um, students. And so that was one of the pressure points, just, you know, where do I start and how do I make sure that I'm, I'm using it properly? Yeah, that's some example, Stacy. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and just to wrap up our time together here, um, Sarah, what other specific lessons did the mentees take away from their conversations in their mentor mentee pods? Thanks, Stacy. So I've shared some of that. Um, I think, you know, going back to some of what I was saying now, the importance of providing faculty with data is not enough. And so you really have to support departments with making meaning out of the data you're giving them or that they are themselves collecting um, and really supporting them and taking ownership of it so that they don't feel like it's just something that's, you know, put on their desk and and then not really knowing what to do with it. Um, so, you know, wanting to have faculty become empowered to be change agents and, and really providing them with support so that they have the skills, knowledge, and tools to use that data to improve outcomes for students. Um, some other things, you know, initiative fatigue is real. And so, before adding a new initiative, it's really important that you take stock of what's already in place. And related to that, you know, it's really important to monitor progress, make necessary changes. You know, if you need to cut some programs, you might need to do so because they might be duplicating efforts. And also just accepting failures and, and learning from mistakes. So, you know, we had a lot of mentee campuses just dealing with you know, people see this as just one other thing or the flavor of the day. So how do you bring in different programs and initiatives so that they are complementing each other rather than taking away attention or, or, or making it feel like, you know, there, there isn't anything else I can do. There's just so much going on. Um, and Sarah, Sarah, I think we yeah, need to wrap up. Um, no problem. But, this is great, and thank you. And Stacy, thank you for managing the Q&A from the audience. Um, thank you also to the audience for participating in this fourth webinar of our anniversary series. Our, our next webinar will be in September, and I'll be hosting that one, and we're gonna be discussing new uses of technology to help learners gain appropriate access to what they need to attain high value credentials. So please go to the NCHIMS website to register and this webinar 
will be archived at the at the site and we encourage you to share the link with others you think would be would like it thank you finally to sarah torres lugo and paul dusal for sharing your experiences and we really appreciate the effort appreciate the effort and time thank you thank you sally